Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Identification of Pre-Existing Adaptive Immune Responses to CAS-9 in Humans. It is presented by Karsten Charlesworth, who is a PhD student in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine at Stanford University. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. So before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the ask a question box, which is located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Karsten Charlesworth. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay, hi. So yeah, as Judy introduced, I'm Karsten and I'm here at Stanford University in the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine. And today I'm going to be talking about some uh, work that uh, we recently published uh, earlier this year in January on BioArchive as a preprint publication and is currently under review in Nature Medicine where we have identified the existence of pre-existing adaptive immune responses to Cas9 in humans. So as many of you, as probably all of you are aware, since you're following along with this webinar, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system has become a very powerful tool for genome editing and is being rapidly applied towards the treatment of genetic disease, either through the delivery of the CRISPR-Cas9 system into cells ex vivo to edit cells and then to engraft those edited cells back into a patient to treat some form of disease, or through the packaging of the CRISPR-Cas9 system into either nanoparticles or viral vectors to deliver it directly into patients to and perform in vivo genome editing to treat some form of disease. And many groups are rushing forward to apply the CRISPR-Cas9 system to, uh, to treat many different diseases. For instance, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, sickle cell disease, and even the first clinical trial involving the CRISPR-Cas9 system has been approved in the US. However, the most common, form, uh, common homologs of Cas9 that most people are working with are derived from Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, S. pyogenes is the bacteria that causes strep throat, and S. aureus is the bacteria that causes staph infections. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be referring to these two homologs of Cas9 as SP Cas9 for the homolog derived from S. pyogenes, and SA Cas9 for the homolog derived from S. aureus. Uh, S. aureus. And the S. pyogenes Cas9 is typically used for in vitro editing, and it was the first Cas9 that was really applied towards genome editing. And the S. aureus Cas9 is a more recent variant of Cas9 that has been developed and is typically applied towards in vivo editing as its smaller packaging, uh, smaller protein size allows it to be more easily packaged into viral vectors for delivery into patients in vivo. However, while many groups are making a lot of progress on potentially treating genetic disease using these two homologs of Cas9, uh, the bacteria that they come from are common human commensals and often human pathogens. S. pyogenes inhabits roughly 20% of the population at any given time, and S. aureus inhabits roughly 40% of the population at any given time. And if you look for antibodies against these bacteria and T cell responses against these bacteria, basically anyone who's over the age of 18 has antibodies and T cells against these bacteria. And so given that, given that uh, pre-existing immunity to both of these bacteria is very common in the, pop in the population, we ask the, the question, is it possible that during our normal lifespans that we develop immunity to Cas9 protein as a result of exposure to these bacteria, either through Cas9 from these bacteria being taken up by a B cell, which then goes on to make plasma cells, which make antibodies that are specific against Cas9, or through Cas9 being taken up by antigen-presenting cells in a person, which then go on to activate naive T cells, which produce memory and effector T cells as a result. 
Now, for therapeutic genome editing, the presence of antibodies against Cas9 may not necessarily be a cause for concern. Antibodies, antibodies in the bloodstream will neutralize anything in the bloodstream. So if you have antibodies against the specific virus that you're using as a vector to deliver Cas9, they would not likely neutralize the virus. However, since pretty much all methodologies that involve using the CRISPR-Cas9 system to treat disease currently involve in, uh, inserting Cas9 into cells, this shouldn't be a concern. However, the existence of T cells against Cas9 could be a concern for, for uh, genome editing, particularly for in vivo genome editing. As, any, as T cells will recognize any cell that has Cas9 inside of it, as the, the cells that receive Cas9 will present pieces of Cas9 on their surface, and the T cells will respond, if they are antigen specific to Cas9, will respond by releasing cytokines that kill cells that have Cas9 inside of them. Thus, if you are, for instance, doing in vivo genome editing and delivering Cas9 to the liver, if you have T cells that recognize cells that have Cas9 inside of them, they will clear the cells that receive Cas9 with, uh, and will likely cause a loss of any kind of therapeutic effect as any of the cells you genome edited will be removed from the body. So, while, um, while antibodies against Cas9 are not necessarily a concern for therapeutic genome editing, to determine if there were antigen-specific T cells against Cas9, we first looked to see if we could det detect antibodies that were specific against Cas9 in the human population, as antibodies are significantly easier to detect than T cell responses, and the detection of antibodies against Cas9 in the regular human population would be indicative of, of the fact that human immune systems are both exposed to Cas9 and therefore likely also have a T cell response against Cas9, um, a pre-existing T cell response against Cas9. And so to look, look, look for humoral responses to Cas9 or uh, antibody responses, pre-existing antibody responses to Cas9, we first use an immunoblot approach. And so in the immunoblot approach, we blot one microgram of either Cas9 homolog onto a PVDF membrane. We then block the membrane with milk and then incubate the membrane with human serum diluted at 1 to 10 overnight. So in this case, the human serum is essentially serving as a primary antibody against Cas9. We then incubate the membrane with anti-human FC antibody conjugated to horseradish peroxidase diluted at 1 to 5,000, and then we develop the blot. And if there are antibodies against Cas9 in the human serum, what we expect to see is a clear band, what we expect to see is a band for Cas9 in the resulting blot that we develop. And so what I'm showing you here are the results from 34 donors, and this was a figure in the uh, preprint that we published in January, where we, and, um, where, where we saw a variety of different antibody responses to Cas9 in different donors. But what I want to focus you on is a couple of specific donors that we found responses uh, to Cas9. <laughs> So what you can see here is a very, very differences in against the different homologs of Cas9 between donors. For instance, if you focus in on donor 321 found on the left, the, you can see that this donor had serum that could very clearly bind to and detect S. aureus Cas9 and um, detected SP Cas9 to a much weaker extent. If you look at donor 323 on the right, you can see that donor 323 um, clearly had antibodies against S. pyogenes Cas9, while there was no detectable response against S. aureus Cas9. And if you look on the very right at donor 325, you can see that the, this donor ha had no detectable levels of anti antibodies by Western blot against either the pyogenes homolog of Cas9 or the aureus homolog of Cas9, at least by Western blot. Having found that we could clearly detect antibodies against Cas9 in the human population, we next set up an ELISA to try and detect to see to de detect antibodies against Cas9, because an ELISA is both quantitative and it allows for much more high throughput screening for donors to see if there are pre-existing humoral responses to Cas9. So, in the prin the principle of the ELISA is that you have a plate which you will then put your antigen of you'll put your antigen of interest into. In this case, we're putting Cas9. The plate will get coated with Cas9 protein. You can block empty spots on the plate. And then what you have is a plate that has Cas9 coated all over it. Um, and then what you'll do is you wash the plate, and then you'll introduce serum from, your, from whatever donor you're interested in looking at. And if the donor that you're looking at has antibodies specific against Cas9, those antibodies will, be, will bind specifically to Cas9 in the plate. You can then wash out the serum. And if there are specific antibodies, they'll remain on the Cas9. And then you can introduce your secondary antibody, which is specific against uh, human, 
which is specific against human antibodies and will be conjugated to Horstratus peroxidase. Again, you wash the plate. And then finally, you can develop the plate with substrate. And if there are antibodies that bind Cas9, and the secondary, and that, the secondary antibodies that bind those antibodies that bind Cas9, the substrate will change color in the plate, and you can measure this absorbance at 450 nanometers and determine you know, if there are antibodies against Cas9 and how high the titer of antibodies is in a given individual. And so we first went and titered the, uh, rate, the, the amount of serum to use on, on our ELISA for different, uh, for different donors. Here, what we did is we used tetanus toxoid as a positive control to detect people to, uh, to detect antibodies. As almost everyone has antibodies against tetanus toxoid, as we almost all receive uh, receive our tetanus vaccin vaccination once every ten years. And then we used human albumin, which is a protein commonly found in blood, as a negative control, as we sh you shouldn't be able to detect any kind of antibodies against a uh, human protein, which is common in the blood. At the top of each of these graphs that you can see in, the, in this uh, slide it's, uh, is the dilution of serum that we used to, uh, to probe with. So on the top left, we, used, uh, we diluted human serum 1 to 10 to probe for anti human antibodies against tetanus toxoid, human albumin, SA-Cas9, and SP-Cas9. And in the bottom right, we used a dilution of 1 to 1,000 of human serum to detect each of the different antigens. And what you can see is that at each different titration that we used, you can see a significant difference in the absorbance when tetanus toxoid, SA-Cas9, or SP-Cas9 is being probed against versus our negative control human albumin. So after having titered the uh, level, of, uh, level of serum to use for our ELISA, we next performed a wider screen using a serum dilution of 1 to 50. We use the serum dilution of 1 to 50 as it gave us the most dynamic range in absorbances, and also because it's a very common dilution of serum to use when looking for specific antibodies against any kind of antigen. And so what you can see here on the right, on the right figure is that we are able to, again, see a clear statistically significant increase in the frequency in the absorbance of, uh, from our ELISA plates when we have SA-Cas9 or SVP-Cas9 on, on our ELISA compared to when we look at human albumin. What you can even see very clearly uh, to the left is that even in the tetanus toxoid uh, samples, where almost all donors show up positive, if you look at the bottom left of the figure, you'll see a single dot where somebody showed up as having being negative, uh, negative for having any kind of uh, tetanus toxoid, uh, texo tetanus toxoid antibodies by absorbance, um, indicating that they are either an anti-vaxxer or not you know, up to date with their uh, their tetanus toxoid vaccine. So to determine, to determine where we would put the cutoff for what we considered a donor that was positive for having humoral or an, an anti pre-existing antibody response to Cas9, we took the mean of the human albumin samples and then added two standard deviations. And so using this as our positive cutoff threshold, we find that 99% of the donors that we screened were positive for having antibodies against tetanus toxoid. 80% of donors were positive for having antibodies against the S. aureus Cas9, and 56% of donors were positive for having antibodies against SP Cas9. While 2% of human albumin samples showed up positive, which you can see by the two, bot, two dots that are above the dotted line we have on the graph, um, indicating that we do have a low, uh, a low full pos positive rate of about 2%. And so we have clearly detected, clearly shown that we were able to detect antibodies against Cas9. But as I was talking about earlier, uh, antibodies against Cas9 aren't necessarily uh, any impediment to using Ca the CRISPR-Cas9 system for therapeutic genome editing. What it is of much more of a concern is, are there any specific T cells in the population against Cas9? And so the first assay that we used to see if we could detect antigen-specific T cells against Cas9 was a cytokine capture assay. And the principle of the cytokine capture assay is that we take peripheral blood mononuclear cells from people, so cells of your, all of this, drawing cells of your blood, um, except for your red blood cells, and we get rid of those. You put all of those cells in a culture, and then you'll introduce your antigen of interest, in this case, Cas9. What will happen is that cells in the cells in that culture of uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells you take will take up Cas9, and they will, they will break up Cas9 and put little fragments of Cas9 onto the surface of themselves. If there are antigen-specific T cells present in that culture against Cas9, they will be able to recognize Cas9 on the surface of those cells that are presenting it. And in response to recognizing Cas9, they release different cytokines. 
Now here we're here what we're looking at is specifically interferon gamma. And so T cells that respond that respond to Cas9 on the surface of other cells release interferon gamma in response to detecting detecting Cas9. We can then use a capture antibody to detect interferon gamma as it's being released from interferon uh, to detect interferon gamma as it's being released from T cells that are antigen specific to Cas9. And we can then stain for, for interferon gamma that's caught at the surface of cells with another antibody that's attached to a fluorophore, and then detect antigen specific T cells that are releasing interferon gamma using flow cytometry. And so what I'm showing you, showing you here is a representative image from the preprint that we put up in January, where we were able to detect a cellular response to S. aureus Cas9, but we're not able to detect a cellular or T cell response to pyogenes Cas9. And so what you can see in the very left of the figure, figure is an unstimulated control. And so these are cells that are just cultured in regular media, media that has 5% human serum. And what you can see is that they have very, we're, we have a very low background where we don't detect very many interferon gamma positive cells. However, to the very right of that, you can see that when SA Cas9 is introduced into the culture, you can see that we can very clearly now detect interferon gamma positive cells. In the same figure, you can see that we don't really pick up too many pyogenes Cas9 T cells over background. And in the very right is our positive control. And these are cells that were stimulated with a viral peptide pool mix, which have uh, viral peptides from several different viruses, such as herpes, mono, and a few others, and viruses that almost everyone has been exposed to throughout their regular lifespan. And as you can see, again, here we can detect a very clear response against the viral peptide pool. Now, in, initial, in our initial preprint, we, did not, we had not detected any antigen-specific T cells against the pyogenes homolog of Cas9. However, shortly after our preprint, uh, another group, uh, Wagner and Amani et al., published another, article, published another preprint article on BioArchive where they showed they were able to detect at high frequencies, almost ubiquitously, uh, TSP Cas9 specific T cells, um, which we had not initially detected in, in our preprint. And so based on their findings, um, we decided to go back and use several other assays to try and detect, uh, detect antigen-specific T cells very thoroughly and to, to figure out you know, exactly what kind of frequencies we were able to find them at and if we could detect SPCAS9 T cells in particular. And so there are three different assays that we focus on that detect, uh, detect antigen-specific T cells against the two homologues of Cas9. We used intracellular cytokine, cytokine staining, which I have up here as intracellular cytokine capture assay as a, as a typo. We, used, we also looked to see if we could detect um, cells that were antigen-specific by activation markers, since when T cell, antigen-specific T cells do become activated when they encounter their specific antigen, they will put CD137 or CD154 or both onto their, onto their surface, which we can detect by, uh, by, stain, by staining and flow cytometry. And then finally, we used an ally spot assay to try and detect antigen specific T cells against the two homologs. And so, first, I'm going to talk about our results from performing intracellular cytokine assays staining to try and detect antigen specific T cells against Cas9. And so, the workflow for intracellular cytokine staining, or ICS, is that we take peripheral blood mononuclear cells that we've frozen down, we thaw them out, we then allow them to rest overnight. And then after allowing them to rest, we'll add in our respective antigen. And so in this case, we use as a positive control tetanus toxoid, and then we, or SA Cas9, SP Cas9, and then the unstimulated control is just in media with 5% human serum. We put in our antigens for two hours, and then after two hours, we add Berfeldin A. And Berfeldin A is a Golgi inhibitor. And so if there are any T cells that are responding to the antigens we'll put in there and are producing cytokines as a result, since their Golgi can't operate properly, these cytokines will start building up in their Golgi. And after four hours of adding the, adding the Berfeldin A, we can then perform intracellular cytokine staining to look for the cytokines that have built up inside of the cell. Once we've stained intracellularly for these cytokines, we can then analyze for cytokine-positive T cell by flow cytometry. And so our gating to detect antigen-specific T cells by, um, by looking for int by, by intracellular cytokine staining is that to the, the very left, you can see that we, we gate specifically on the lymphocyte population. We then gate on live cells. And then to the very, li to the very right, you can see that we gate on, sorry, we gate on single cells, then we gate on live cells, which you can see to the very, very right. And we use a live dead fixable blue stain to determine live cells versus dead cells. 
We then gate on CD3 positive cells, and then we, when we hone in specifically on the CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells. And then to the very left, you can see the very at the very end, we are looking at uh, CD4 positive, CD8 positive T cells that are either po that are positive for TNF alpha, IL2, or interferon gamma. All cytokines that T cells um, release in response to being stimulated by their specific antigen. And so, uh, what I'm showing you here in, the, in this in this slide is representative uh, flow cytometry images from a donor that showed up being positive. It showed up as being positive for both uh, having antigen specific T cells against SA Cas9 and SP Cas9 donor 219. And so, at the very top left is our unstimulated control. And what you can see is that in our unstimulated control, you can see that there are almost no cells that are showing up as being cytokine positive for either interferon gamma, TNF alpha, or IL2, so a very low background. Now, to the right of that, you can see that in our positive control, the tetanus uh, control, where you can see that there are cells showing you can see that there are lots of cells, well, not that, there are some cells that are showing up as interferon gamma positive, TNF alpha positive, and, or IL2, or and IL2 positive. Now, while there aren't that many cells that are showing up, um, this is to be expected. Antigen-specific T cells are very rare in your bloodstream. To any particular antigen, you would expect to find antigen-specific T cells in the bloodstream at 0 0.01 uh, to, to point, sorry, 0.1 to 0 0.01 percent of your total T cell population. So they're very rare. Now, if you look down in the bottom two, two panels of this figure, you can see that when we add SA Cas9 or SP Cas9 to our PBMC population, that we have a, we have a, we have a significant increase in the number of uh, T cells that are positive for having interferon gamma, TNF alpha, or IL2 compared to the unstimulated control. Now, we performed this assay on 18 different donors. And then we, this is the, what I'm showing you here is the results from all of these 18 different donors. So to the right is uh, to the right of this uh, of this of this panel, and this is the figure that is showing the percent of different cytokines, uh, diff different T cells that show up for the different cytokines, be it interferon gamma, IL two, TNF alpha, and you can see that the average um, in all cases, whether you're introducing SA Cas9, SP Cas9, or tetanus toxoid, is uh, is above the unstimulated control. And to the left, what I'm showing you. Uh, is the total number of cytokine positive T cells. So this is tallying up all the T cells that showed up as being interferon gamma positive, IL-2 positive, interferon gamma and IL-2 positive, and just putting them as, a, as a, what percentage they all the cytokine positive T cells make up of the, of the whole T cell population. And so what you can see again is that all the averages are, back, are, are above background, um, and they're all statistically significant, although I forgot to put bars on this chart. Um, and so the way that we determined whether or not a we could, we were a uh, specific donor was positive for having a cytokine um, response in, in response to each of our different antigens is very similar to the way that we set our cutoff for ELISA. So we took the mean of the unstimulated control, and then we added two standard deviations. And that was our cutoff for whether or not a donor was considered positive. And so that little dotted line you're seeing in the left figure is whether or not a particular donor was considered positive. And using that as our cutoff threshold, we detected 50% of uh, our donors as being, uh, had, a, had a detectable level of cytokine response in response to tetanus toxoid being introduced. Note that we had no false positives in the unstimulated control. 66% of donors showed up as being positive for having a cytokine response to S. aureus Cas9. And 44% of donors showed up as having a cytokine response uh, to SP Cas9. And so what we have definitely have some false, false negatives, and most likely in the tetanus toxoid control, what we are definitely seeing is a clear cytokine uh, response in, into SA Cas9 or SP Cas9 being introduced in particular donor, into particular donors. So um, in our original preprint, we had not detected SP Cas9 specific T cells, but just following up with just the intracellular cytokine assay, we've clearly detected antigen specific T cells with Cas9. And so the next assay that we looked at and tried was to see if we could detect antigen-specific T cells looking at the activation markers CD137 and CD154. And these are the two, CD137 in particular is one of the activation markers that was used in the other preprint that I had mentioned where they were looking for antigen, they detected antigen-specific T cells against SP Cas9 pretty much ubiquitously in every donor that they had tested. And so the workflow for this assay is pretty similar to that of done, that's done for the intracellular cytokine staining. 
So we take frozen PBMCs that we have, we thaw them out, rest them overnight, and then we add each of the different antigens in, into culture with, um, with our PBMCs. We then let the PBMCs sit in culture for 16 hours with each specific antigen. And after 16 hours, we'll stain for, we'll stain for, for at the surface of cells CD137 and CD154. And then after staining them, again, we analyze by flow cytometry. And the gating for detecting CD137 and CD154 positive T cells is almost exactly the same as the intracellular cytokine staining. Um, the only difference is we use a different live dead marker. In this case, we use DAPI. And then instead of looking at the different cytokines, we're looking at CD137 and CD154, which you can see in the bottom left of this bigger panel. And so what I'm showing you in this slide is the representative images from a single positive donor, donor 219, which is the same donor that I was showing you for intracellular cytokine staining. So now you're seeing the same donor had the same results across two different assays. Um, and so in the top left there, you, in the unstimulated control, you can see that while you can see that there is some background um, in both, for both CD137 and CD154. So 0.12% of T cells are showing up as positive for CD137 in the unstimulated, and 0.031% of T cells are showing up as positive for CD154 in the unstimulated control. So there's always some background when you do this assay. Um, that's to be expected. But to the very right of the unstimulated control, you can see that in the tetanus toxoid sample, you can see that there's significantly more CD137 and CD154 positive cells. And similarly, if you look at the bottom two panels, you can see that in the samples that received SA Cas9 and SP Cas9, there's significantly more uh, more CD137 positive and CD154 positive T cells than the unstimulated control. And so again, we we screened 18 donors looking for an increase in the frequency of activation markers in T cells when we introduce each of our different antigens compared to the unstimulated control. And so on the left, you can see that it, we had a significantly higher percentage of CD137 positive T cells compared to our unstimulated control when we introduced SA Cas9, SP Cas9, or tetanus toxoid into our samples. And similarly, on our in our in the right panel, you can see that when we introduce um, SP Cas9 compared to the unstimulated control, we have a significant increase. And when we introduce tetanus toxoid into into our sample, we have a significant increase. Um, all right, when we introduced SA Cas9, we didn't have a statistically significant increase in CD154, um, but you know the p value is just a little bit above p.05. But you can very clearly see that there are some donors that is significantly above above the background of the unstimulated control. Now, um, compared to the Wagner preprint that I was talking about earlier, we don't see quite as, as large of an increase in the frequency of CD137 positive T cells as what they found, which is what I'm showing you to the right here when we introduce SP Cas9. Um, we do find a statistically significant difference. Uh, this could just be due to um, differences in, in processing. For instance, we use frozen cells, which are known to stimulate less than freshly harvested T cells, which is what they used in their study. Um, it could be in methodology, it could be in staining, um, it could even just be a different in our donors, difference in the donors that we had, had available. However, if we take the background of CD137 positive T cells and the background of CD154 positive T cells that we're able to detect, and then subtract that from each of the samples that received each of the different antigens, what you can see is that in almost all samples, there was a higher frequency of CD137 positive or CD154 positive T cells over background. So if you look at CD137, almost 100% 100 of samples had a greater than background frequency of CD137 positive T cells um, when you introduced tetanus toxoid, 88% when you introduced SA Cas9, 100% when you introduced SP Cas9. Similarly, when you, um, when you look at CD154% of positive T cells, uh, you can see that there is 94% of T uh, 94% of donors were above background for CD154, 94% when you introduce SA Cas9, and 88% when you introduce SP Cas9. Um, all of the dots that you can see at the very bottom of the y-axis um, are set where it's set to 0 0.001. Those are samples that were at or below the unstimulated control um, and were just set to the very bottom of the, of the, of the graph.
graph here. Um, but what you can clearly see is that there's an increase in both of these activation markers when you're introducing all three of these antigens. Again, indicating that there are definitely antigen-specific T cells in the population against both SA-Cas9 and SP-Cas9. And then finally, the last assay that we use to look for antigen-specific T cells um, in, in different donors against SA-Cas9 and SP-Cas9 is an ELISPOT assay. And this is my personal favorite assay for looking for antigen-specific T cells, um, not only because it's the easiest to perform, but also because it gives you the most clear uh, indicator visually that there are antigen-specific T cells in a sample. And so that's the last one I'm going to be talking about right now. And so the workflow for an ELISA spot is fairly similar to that of the ELISA. So we'll have a plate that has a piece of filter paper at the very bottom of it. Uh, sorry, not fil filter paper, a piece of paper at the very bottom of it. And on that piece of uh, paper will be uh, anti-interferon gamma antibodies that have been pre-coded onto the plate. Then what we can do is we can take our PBMCs from whichever donor we're interested in looking at and put them onto the plate. And then we'll add whatever antigen we're in interested in studying into the plate with the cells. We then incubate the cells with whatever antigen we're interested in for two days. And if there are antigen-specific T cells present in that population that we put in their plate, um, they're going to react to cells that have taken up that antigen and release interferon gamma in the process. Antibodies at the very very bottom of the plate are going to be able to pick up and hold on to the interferon gammas um, that they release surrounding them. So there will be little, little spots wherever there are T cells releasing interferon gamma of antibodies that are now bound to interferon, that are now bound to interferon gamma on the plate. After two days, we'll wash out the T cells and the media that we've put on the plate. And then we'll add, then introduce our primary antibody, which is another antibody that's specific for interferon gamma. And so any, any spots on the plate where interferon gamma will bind, our primary antibody um, will then bind, and our primary antibody is uh, conjugated to biotin. We will then wash the plate, and then introduce uh, streptavidin conjugated to alkaline phosphatase. And so any of the places where the primary antibody has bind, now streptavidin um, conjugated to, to alkaline phosphatase is going to bind on the plate. We can wash everything out again, and then finally, what we end up with is any place where interferon gamma has bound on the plate, we're going to get spots where our primary antibody and then streptavidin, conjugated alkaline phosphatase, will have bound. And it will be in just particular spots on the plate. We can then introduce our sub substrate and any areas where there have been, um, where our secondary antibody has bound due to the presence of interferon gamma, the alkaline phosphatase is going to react with the substrate we introduce to result in a substrate that's going to get deposited right around the areas wherever there have been, wherever interferon gamma has been found. And once we wash everything out and wash it away, what we end up with is a, is a plate is a plate with a little piece of paper at the bottom. And on that, on that piece of paper, you're going to be seeing little blue spots. And each one of those spots represents an area where a single T cell has been releasing interferon gamma in response to a specific antigen. And so one spot equals one antigen-specific T cell. And so this is a uh, representative images from what this looks like when you get to the end of this assay. And so these representative, Im this representative images are again from the same donor, donor 219. So you're seeing the same donor is showing up positive across multiple different assays. And so you can see to the very left in the unstimulated control, you have three, uh, three blue dots on the plate. Whereas in the SA-Cas9, SP-Cas9, and tetanus toxoid cells, you know, being cultured with those antigens, you're seeing many, many more spots. And so the way we would analyze this data is we would take the number of spots that were found, let's say, in the SA-Cas9 well, and then we would subtract the number of spots that are in the unstimulated control. So if the, in the SA-Cas9 uh, SA well, you find 20 spots, then you would subtract three. So you would say that there are 17 spot-forming cells in that well. And since we put 500,000 cells in each well, the way that we tabulate that data is it would be 17 spot-forming cells per 500,000 cells. And so what I'm showing you in this, uh, this slide right here is the results from doing this assay on 18 different donors again. Um, and what you can see, and is, so what we've done is we subtracted the unstimulated from all of the all of the samples that have received um, antigen. And you can see that there there are definitely um, lots of donors that have uh, that are have 
you know, numbers of spot forming cells that are above the unstimulated control. So of the 18 donors that we screened, 77% um, had a greater than background for uh, number of spots for SA Cas9, 50% for SP Cas9, and then 100% when tetanus toxoid was introduced. Now, which is almost um, remarkably right about where the frequency of which we find antibodies against Cas9 in the population. Now, um, what, um, what, uh, what, so the, um, the other thing on this graph is, is if you look at the red dots that are on this graph, um, those are all samples that were not found to be statistically significant, um, either because there was, mostly because there was just too much variance in between the different samples. Um, so of, the, of all the different donors that we screened, 55% uh, had a statistically significant greater than background number of spot forming cells than the unstimulated control. Um, 33% when we introduced SP Cas9 and 78% when we introduced tetanus toxoid. So finally, you know, we've clearly been detecting antigen specific T cells against Cas9, but as I was talking about before, antigen specific T cells against any antigen are very rare. And so the signal that you get from most assays is very weak. And so to validate that all of these assays that we've been doing have actually been detecting antigen-specific T cells against any particular antigen, the last thing we do is we take those these rare antigen-specific T cells, we specifically isolate them out, and then expand them. And then what we can do is we can re-stimulate them. And the idea is, is that once you have um, you know expanded population of this, when you re-stimulate this, or stimulate that population, whatever signal you get at the very end should be very, very clear. And so to expand and then to isolate, expand, and re-stimulate um, antigen-specific T cells against any antigen, um, but, you know, particularly for Cas9 in this case, what we do is we take a tube and we introduce PBMCs again, and then we'll introduce our antigen. Um, and then after 16 hours, we'll do what we did before for the activation marker, where we'll then take those cells and stain on the extracellular surface of the cell for the presence of CD137 and CD154. We can then sort for these activated T cells by um, flow cytometry, take these activated T cells, and then we'll culture them on irradiated uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from the same donor. And the reason we culture them on irradiated peripheral blood mononuclear cells is that um, you know these these T cells need uh, certain signals and cytokines from those from those same cells that um, that we irradiated, and we irradiate them to prevent this, the other, these cells that we introduce from expanding as well. So that the only thing that's expanding in culture is the T cells that we've uh, plated in with these irradiated PBMCs. We'll culture these uh, T cells that we've isolated for a period of ten days in the presence of IL two. And then what we'll end up with is an expanded population of T cells. We can then take these T cells and then re-stimulate them with, with PBMCs from the same donor that have been depleted of T, T cells um, using a max depletion. So that now these T cells that we've expanded are introduced with everything with PBMCs from the same donor, except there are no T cells. So that when we do flow cytometry, the only T cells that we're looking at are the T cells that we've expanded in culture. We'll then introduce the specific antigen that the T cells uh, should be specific for, and then after, then we can do intracellular cytokine staining. And what we'd expect to see is that we have, you know, most of these T cells that we've expanded should have a strong cytokine response in um, after after being re-stimulated with their specific antigen. And so what I'm showing you here is the results from our re-stimulation. Um, and so on the left are SA Cas9 specific T cells that have been isolated and expanded over a period of 10 days. And on the right are SP Cas9 specific T cells, which have been isolated and expanded. Now on the, um, on the top slide is SA Cas9 and SP Cas9 specific T cells that were re-stimulated with tetanus toxoid. So if you look at the top half um, of the, of the facts panels, you can see that there is very low levels of cytokines being produced in these T cells when they're re-stimulated with tetanus toxoid, which is not the antigen they're specific for. But if you look at the bottom panel, when you re-stimulate SA Cas9 specific T cells with SA Cas9, you have a, market, a very notable in increase in the frequency of cytokine positive T cells. And the same thing when you reintroduce SP Cas9 specific T cells with um, SP Cas9. For instance, if we look at you know one single um, one single cytokine, if you look at SA Cas9, when you introduce SA Cas9 specific T cells with tetanus toxoid, you have 2.33% of cells that are positive, uh, that are TNF alpha positive. However, when you when you introduce SA Cas9 specific T cells with SA Cas9, 
42.2% of these T cells are now positive for TNF-alpha, demonstrating a clear um, antigen-specific response to SA-Cas9. And so in summary, we've detected a clear, we've detected both um, clear humoral and cell-mediated uh, pre-existing response to the Cas9 in the population. So at pretty high frequencies, the population is essentially being pre-immunized against Cas9. Um, looking at just, you know, aureus-specific responses, you know, we find that we are able to detect um, antibodies against S, S, um, S Cas9 in 80% of people. We can detect T cell responses by intracellular cytokine staining in 66% of people, T cell responses by a lie spot in 55% of people, and then looking at activation markers um, that are induced when we introduce Cas9 into, into uh, back in with, with cells, we find that 88% of donors had an increase in CD137 over background, and 94% had an increase in CD154 over background. And then for S. pyogenes Cas9, we find that we detect 56% of people as being positive as measured by uh, antibody responses by ELISA, 44% of people by intracellular cytokine staining, 33% by a live spot, and then 100% by an increase in CD137 activation and 88% by an increase in CD154 activation. And so this is pretty much all the data I have to present to you today. Um, I do have a lot of people to thank for, you know, helping me to get this, you know, uh, to, to present and, you know, make all this data. Um, you know, particularly, you know, my, my PI, Matthew Porteous, whose lab I did all this work in, and Daniel Devo, the postdoc, who, you know, mentored me throughout this whole process. Um, also, Joe Camarena, Kyle Koroma, and Victor Lemgar all, all helped a lot with, with producing a lot of this data. Um, from the Weinberg Lab, um, my, my co-author, Priyanka Deshpande, and, um, you know, Ken Weinberg, who, who helps a lot with, uh, you know, structuring these T-cell assays. Um, Chris Vakaluskis, um, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying his name wrong, from IDT. Um, he and his team produced all the protein that we use for these assays. And then finally, uh, members of the Ron Corallo Lab at Stanford here um, also helped a lot with, uh, you know, detecting antigen-specific T-cells. Um, and then as far as funding goes, you know, I, I personally was funded uh, through a CERN Bridges internship, which was how I was able to do all this work. Um, and most of it was actually done before I was even a graduate student. And then, um, of course, I have to thank, thank Stanford for, you know, giving me the um, wonderful opportunity to be here and, and do research at Stanford. And so that is, that is it. Um, and I can take any questions. Thank you, Karsten, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, what impacts do you think these results have on therapeutic genome editing with Cas9? Um, for the for any kind of ex vivo therapy where you edit a cell's ex vivo outside of somebody's body and then put them back in, um, I don't know that this will necessarily have a significant impact on those kinds of therapies. Either because Cas9 can you know get out of cell, you know by the time you implant your cell, you can culture the cells long enough that Cas9 will be gone from the cells when you engraft them back in. Um, or in the case of something like a hematopoietic stem cell, um, you know, the bone marrow niche is come up, considered somewhat um, immunoprivileged. So once the, your hematopoietic stem cells, if you edit them and put them back in, go back into somebody, um, they should, once they make it to the bone marrow, be safe. Now, for in vivo therapies, I think this is much more of a concern because whether you introduce SPCAS9 using nanoparticles or you introduce SACAS9 into somebody using viruses, um, the presence of pre-existing immune responses means that your, your immune system is going to be able to respond very quickly to any, any cell that receives Cas9. And so, you know, in previous clinical trials where, for instance, somebody has had pre-existing uh, T cell responses to an a, a adeno-associated viral vector, um, there has been nullification of any therapeutic effect from treatment because all the cells that received your gene therapy vector end up being cleared from the body. And you know you can imagine even in you can imagine even more severe cases where if you have lots of Cas9 being expressed, you you have somebody who has a very high responder to SA Cas9. Um, this, while it's probably unlikely, you could even end up with a worst case scenario of someone like Jesse Gelsinger who had you know a serious inflammatory response to the 
you know, the gene therapy he, vector he received in the 90s, which resulted in his death. Um, and while I don't think anyone should panic and that this is necessarily the, the response, I think this is something that definitely has to be considered before anyone goes into a clinical trial with Cas9 and at least considered and further studied to look um, and see if there will be any adverse impacts from, from, from these findings. Thank you for that. Next one is, are there any potential methods to get around a pre-existing adaptive immunity to Cas9? Um, yeah, so there are a number of different methods that you could take to try and get around this. Um, you know, one, if there's an immunodominant epitope, so a single part in Cas9 or a couple of parts that are the pieces that most people's immune system are trained to target, you could engineer um, the Cas9 to be slightly different around those areas, and that, and that would that would abolish any pre-existing immune response. You could use you could introduce T regulatory cells that suppress um, adaptive immune responses to Cas9. Or you could try and find uh, Cas9 or other, um, you know, site-specific nucleases that don't, there are no pre-existing immune responses. So, you know, for instance, the first in vivo gene, gene therapy trial has already begun. Um, it was begun by Sengamoi earlier this year. Um, however, they were using zinc fingers, which mostly use parts from the human body. Um, and I don't think there are any pre-existing immune responses. And so that is another way to get around this issue. Thank you for that. Looks like we have time for one last question. Can you comment on why you find a higher frequency of antibodies against Cas9 compared to T cells? Um, so I think finding a higher frequency of antibodies versus uh, T cells is not is not that surprising. Um, antibodies are significantly easier to detect against any antigen than T cells necessarily are, um, and there have even been you know again um, you know going back to those AAV trials, there there were some cases where you know a, a donor was ruled out as being um, being negative for for having having an immune response to the viral vector they used only for them to later find out that, you know, the, the person did have T cells that were antigen specific against their viral vector, but they just hadn't been able to identify them in their, in their initial screens. Um, so I think it makes sense that, you know, we find it's easier to find antibodies, which are lots of proteins released into the blood than, you know, a few very rare single cells um, that, that can be, well, not single, but very rare in, in terms of proportion of the T cells in the blood. Well, I would like to once again thank Karsten Charlesworth for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 3rd, 2019. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.